I am Armando Lucas Correa, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Armando Lucas Correa. It's episode 271 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, please click on the links in the right-hand sidebar to subscribe to the show. That way you don't miss an episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We're going to be telling you about them throughout the show uh, for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, go to hankgarner.com and click on the link to advertise. It's up in the top uh, menu bar. There's a brand new collection I'd like to tell you about. It's called Chronicles of Mirrorstone. And right now, it is available for pre-order for only 99 cents, and that's through December 1st. Go grab it before then, because you will not want to miss this collection. 200 years ago, the Dwarven clans and the Elvish houses of Mirrorstone were at peace. The king of the dwarves, in a selfish and greedy mood, used his wizards to expand their mountain empire, raising new peaks from the forest floors of their elven neighbors. War and hatred ensue. The Chronicles of Mirrorstone offers a glimpse into the lives of the elves and dwarves living in the aftermath as they seek for a new peace. Six talented authors lend their voices to a tale of destruction, mistrust, and hope. The Chronicles of Mirrorstone, go grab it right now at the wonderful pre-order price of only 99 cents. There's a link in the show notes. We knew it would be bad. But there are levels of bad. There was no scale that could have measured this one. Residents listened as 130 mile per hour winds tore away their roofs and struggled to stay alive as water crept into their homes, threatening to drown people in their living rooms. When the winds died and the rain finally stopped, the streets were only navigable by boat. The death toll rose to over 70 and more than 1 million cars flooded with an estimate of $100 billion in destruction. How does a community, a city, a state survive when hit by a monster storm and then have every square inch covered by over four feet of water? A storm which can only be described as a 1,000 year flooding event worse than Hurricane Katrina and broke all historical records. Lived through one man's experience as the world grew more and more uncertain. Experienced through the medium of social media the day-by-day visceral experience of watching people's lives permanently altered and the heart-filling moments when strangers, neighbors, and friends stepped up and helped those in trouble. Watch as needs are met, lives preserved, and hope restored in the two months following Harvey. Get your signed paperback copy of Two Months with Harvey by Terry R. Hill. Go to terryrhill.net. Proceeds from this project are going to benefit people still struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. terryrhill.net. Two months with Harvey. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Armando Lucas Correa on the show with me today. He has a phenomenal book called The German Girl, and we're going to talk all about it today. It's a a really amazing book. Uh, Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us today, Armando. Thank you for having me. Armando, I begin each uh, show with the same question, and that question is, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, my God. I always read them, I think. Ever since I was a child, the first thing I ever published, other than essays, was a play, Final Exam, that won an award in Havana. You know, I'm Cuban. And then I started working on a novel about the, you know, about 19... 80s in Cuba that I will never publish. It was something, you know, from my youth. And years later, an editor for Rayo, you know, Harper Collins, approached me and asked me to write about how I became a father via surrogacy. 
that book was called in, in Finding Emma, My Daughter. And Johanna Castillo, now my editor as a man Schuster, read the book in 2009, I think. And from that day, it was published. We've been in talks about me writing an old book. I think since 2009, I am, I am preparing to, to have the, the German girl, I think. Awesome. Um, you said that you, uh, you grew up in Cuba, is that right? Yes, I, I was born in Guantanamo, and I grew up in Havana. Uh, I, I really don't know exactly. You know, Guantanamo, we left when I was like a six month old. And I lived until 1991 that I left the country to come here to, to New York. I studied in Cuba. I, I finished college in Cuba. And I started my career as a theater critic theater and dance critic. I worked for a theater magazine called Tablas. And then I was invited by Pratt Institute for a conference here in New York, and I stayed. And the first job that I got, it was in the Miami Herald, the, the El Nuevo Herald Spanish edition from the Miami Herald, as a reporter clerk. I remember that. I worked for the Herald for five years. And then in 1997, they create people in Espanol it's like the Spanish version of People Magazine in Timing, and I moved to New York. I started as a senior writer, and now I am the editor-in-chief of People in Espanol. Wow, what an amazing story. Um, Armando, uh, I have never been to Cuba, as uh, <laughs> pr probably many of, of my listeners have, have not uh, had the, the, uh, the privilege of, of visiting uh, Cuba as well. What do you, as, as someone who grew up there and now lives uh, in New York, uh, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions uh, about life in Cuba to, uh, that, that maybe some uh, of us believe um, but just don't know any better? You know, Cuba is a very complicated place. And for me, because I, I, I was born after Fidel Castro took the power, you know, after the, the revolution, it was the only thing that I knew. At the beginning, it was really hard. And I remember my grandmother, uh, you know, the, during the 60s, 70s, the Christmas, they were not allowed. It was like a very shock for my family. And I remember destroying all this Christmas decoration because it was illegal to have them. And for me, it was fun because we have a lot of things to play, you know, broken all these glasses and everything. And it was, for me, it was normal until you are a teenager and you realize that you have to live in, in silence and your, even your thought, it has to be for yourself. It was a, a really, really a complicated thing for me to growing up. Like, yeah, when you go to college, it's completely different. Yeah, you know, you are an adult and it was claustrophobic for me. And I remember when you live in an island and you don't have information and you don't have access to anything outside the island, it's, it's really claustrophobic. It, 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 I had a benefit of that because I, I, I remember reading obsessively when I was a child and because, because you don't have access to many books, all the books that you have there are the classic. And then I grew up reading, you know, Madame Bovary and... Tostoyevsky and Tolstoy because the only books that they published were the, were the classics. And for me, for example, the Hung, Hundred Year of Solitude, it was my, you know, in, in, the young people has the initiation in porn in some magazine. For me, it was 100 Years of Solitude with Garcia Marquez. It, it was the first time that I read something with sex inside and everything. <laughs> and, and, and that was a little, was a little crazy, but, but you know, Cuba is a beautiful country. People, they are very nice. And, you know, from some people, there is an illusion that this, this kind of social development and that when, when you get, there is no freedom there. This is the huge problem. When I left the country, it, for me, it was really hard because I had all my family there. Then I, I right now, I, I, I bring my family, they're living in Miami, my mother, my sister, my nephew. And Cuba is hard. 
and we, we were never allowed to go back because I was a journalist. I, I, right now, I am an American citizen. I need to apply for a Cuban passport and spend a lot of money for all this permit to go back. And last year, after Obama, you know, opened all this relationship and with the country, I was in the first group of editors and publishers from New York, you know, American publishers. And they invite me to be part of the group. I was, I think, the only Cuban. And I said, okay, I want to go, but uh, I need to apply for all this process. It's completely different than, than you guys. And then they let me in, and for me it was unique because I, I, I just finished my book when I went, and, it, and Cuba is part of the, it's one of the chapters in the book, and it's, it was to go back to all these houses when, you know, Hannah grew up in Cuba. It was very emotional. And then, with the book in hand, uh, we went with the same group in February to the Havana Book Fair, and my editor, you know, in Simon and Schuster, they bring over 100 copies uh, to donate uh, to the small Holocaust Museum that they have in one of the synagogues in, in Havana. And when we went to the Havana Book Fair the first day, all the books that <laughs> it was confiscated and at costume. And, oh, and the next day, you know, they liberate all the books, less the, the German girl. The, the German girl was banned. And I was preparing like a small presentation to this synagogue with, in, with the Holocaust Museum because I want to donate most of the material that I have related to the St. Louis. And it was a nightmare. And this woman from the center was fighting all the time with the government because they want to cancel my presentation because they said that I need a religious visa to do a presentation in the synagogue. And then she explained that I'm not a rabbi, that I'm doing a donation. And she invited, you know, CNN, AP, Reuters, all the correspondent that they, they have in Cuba, and over 300 uh, Jewish, you know, from the community in Havana. And I did the presentation. It was a little scary. And I donated the, the diary from the captain from the St. Louis, signed by him from 1949, and a lot of, you know, uh, the currency from 1939, some pictures, postcard from the St. Louis, and photocopy of the, a lot of material because everything related to the St. Louis, there were like a more than three boxes, disappeared from the National Archive, Archive during the 70s. And if you was part of this tragedy, I thought that they have to have something and I try at least. What an amazing story. Um, uh, Armando, do you, do you feel like um... That with the with the borders opening up and uh, relations beginning uh, to to warm up uh, a little bit, and I, and I know it's going to take a long time for uh, you know for relations to be uh, you know maybe what we hope they will. But do you see hope for for life in Cuba uh, right now? You know, for me, I I, I am a, a different Cuban living. I am an exile, as you know. But right. for me, when you open the doors, everything changed. I am, I am pro open doors. I think when because if you if look at North Korea, you know, if, if they close the door and they keep the mind closed to everybody, and that's the, the only reason they can keep that kind of system. When you open the doors, everything changes, and it helps the people in Cuba. I think I'm not talking about doing you know business with the government or the military or something like that. But when you open, you go, you have to meet the people. I, th I think meeting and talking to people, is an, it, it make a difference. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and what, what you learn, uh, Armando, is that, that people um, all over the world, uh, no matter what culture uh, you come from, we, we all really want the same things. We, we want um, you know, to be happy. We want to have our family. We want to, to have the ability to uh, you know, pursue our dreams. And, and then governments on top of that make things complicated. Uh, but but when, you, when you get to meet the people, um, you know, we're not that different at all. Of course not. Of course yeah. not. I mean, when you know in Cuba, even you are American, and they are saying all the time that you are the enemy, 
they they receive you. They they give you hugs. They give you everything that they have. <laughs> they share the happiness. I love because that. Because at the end, we are human. We are human being, and I I think we, you know. I, I, Part of the German girl, when I, I was writing and thinking about my children, and we, the problem in the, with us, with everybody, I'm including me, we are always afraid of the other one. We're always afraid of the people who has a different skin color, or a different accent, or a different God, or a different sexual orientation. We're always afraid of the others. We have to fight against that, I think. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, be- before we, we get too deep um, in- into the book, The German Girl, um, you are editor-in-chief of People in Español. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how, did you, uh, how did you come to that position? Well, when I started you know, my journalism career here in, 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 in Miami, in the United States, uh, I was writing about politics, election, crime, everything, you know, because... I was starting in, in like a reinventing myself in, in exile. And then at the same time, like a freelancer, I was doing interview for entertainment for one of the section at the Herald. And my dream all the time when I came to United States, it was to live in New York. And New York for me was like a fantasy. It was a dream. And then when they opened People in Espanol, my editor at the moment at the Herald, she moved to the New York Times. And then she talked to the editor at People in Espanol, and, and they were looking for a senior writer. And she said, I have the perfect one for you. And I remember, uh, you know, doing my first interview here in Midtown in Timing with this editor. And when he saw that I have a full-time position at the Herald, I have my first house, you know, that I bought in Miami uh, with my partner. And then when I, I was moving to New York, it was a scary. And said, Armando, I think this is a project for only five years. You know, you have a good life in Miami. What is the reason you want to come to this city with the snow, with the scream, and a lot of people? And I said, I think People in Espanol is a good project. It was the first, you know, Hispanic uh, magazine in, in in Time Inc. at that moment, and I believe in the audience here. And he said, I don't think we're going to survive more than five years. And I said, five years is enough for me. And last year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of people in Espanol. And, you know, the Hispanic population is growing here, and it's a good market. And right now, we are more than people, in, we're more than a magazine. We have a website, we have a social media we have events, and and it's a brand that I can say proudly that we're the number one Hispanic uh, magazine in the United States. Yeah. Well, and and it's a it has a huge circulation. Um, you know, in a yeah. in a time where magazines are, uh, are are a tough business to be in, uh, people in Espanol is has a huge circulation. We have a stable subscriber. We have more than six million, around seven million readers every every month. And we have more than 2 million unique, in U.S. only, in, on the website. And, you know, it's a tough business uh, for everybody in the, in the industry. But we are happy that we're still the number one. And, and you know, it's a challenge. But it's a, that's, that's the thing that I like in my job, that every, every year we, we have to invent something new. That's right, and and that's a it's a great challenge to have to be, uh, not you know you don't have the opportunity to rest on your laurels. You you need to be innovating and uh, and, and finding how to reach that audience and, and coming up with new and uh, engaging content constantly. I would imagine to to keep that thing growing. Yeah, look at the podcast right now. Everybody's doing podcast, and I think we have to do it too here in people in Spanish. I love your page and, and love what you are doing with books and, and this is, this is a new thing. Everybody has to explore it, I think. Yeah. Well then and, and I would I would love to be a part of the uh the people podcast. Just let me know. Of course. <laughs> Um, so Ar- Armando, in the book, The German Girl, this book opened my eyes 
to so many things that I was just completely clueless about. Um, I did not know that there was this, this deep connection with Cuba and uh, Holocaust exiles. Um, mm-hmm. I had no idea that there was a, a Holocaust you know, museum and memorial in Havana. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, I did not know the story of the St. Louis. The St. Louis. Uh, yeah. yeah, what an amazing story. So uh, for, for our listeners that, that don't know um, this incredible story, this true story, um, how did how did you come to the story? How did you uh, learn about it, and how did it come to kind of occupy your mind uh, in the way that you had to write a book about it? Yeah. Well, my grandmother, uh, she's the daughter of a Spanish immigrant. They came, I think, to Cuba at the beginning of the 20th century. She was pregnant with my mom when the St. Louis arrived in Havana. And what happened there, I think, deeply impacted her. And she never tired of telling me all through my uh, childhood, you know, from the next, she, she's always saying that for the next 100 years, Cuba would pay dearly for what he had done to the Jewish refugees. She was a crazy woman. And I remember her uh, during, in May, because it was the anniversary of the boat arriving in Cuba, uh, discussing with my grandfather about, you know, what the Cuba government is to these refugees. And at the same time, during the, the, uh, the 1939, when the boat arrived in Cuba, it was a lot of xenophobe in the country. And they organized like a big protest with more than 40,000 people. It was huge for Havana with the slogan of Cuba for the Cubans. And my grandmother, you know, her, her father and her mother, they came from Spain, they have a small business in Havana. And I, I think it was tough for her when she saw that Cuba rejected over 900 uh, refugees uh, uh, leaving Germany in, in a turbulent moment, 1939, before the war, exactly. Then, uh, I re- when I went to, when I have to go to middle school, in Cuba you have to study Russian, and my grandmother sent me to English classes with a German guy who live in, he used to live in the same block like us, and he was a, a tall guy with white hair, blue eyes, with a strong accent in Spanish, and all the kids in the block, we hate him, because he was screaming all the time when we, when we were playing, and we called him the Nazi. And I went there twice a week to this English class that my grandmother paid him like 20 pesos, 25 pesos, it was a fortune at that moment. And every time she sent me with a bag of food, because food was scarce in Cuba. And when I went to college, uh, my best friend, Aaron, he was the first guy that I met in Cuba. And he's my best friend until today. He told me that uh, his family visit all the time during the 70s in the, that neighborhood in Vedado, visiting this guy that at the end it was not a German guy uh, or a Nazi guy. He was a Jewish refugee that my grandmother was helping all the time. I mix everything in the novel. And this German teacher that everybody called the Nazi is Hannah when uh, she became the English teacher in, in Havana. When I moved to New York, I started uh, to the United States. I started reading everything related to the St. Louis uh, I started buying all these artifacts available. If you go to my apartment in New York, I have like a small museum. I have postcard, currency, a mug, a plate. I bought the diary from the captain in an auction, signed by him. And I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and I have access to over 3,000 original documents, more than 3,000 original documents related to the St. Louis, and a lot of pictures of all these uh, refugees. And you know why they, they, there is a lot of pictures? Because when they left Germany, Hitler only allowed them uh, to live with 10 Reichsmark. This is less than $5 per passenger. And then they bought the Leica, you know, the camera. It was the most sophisticated camera at that moment. And most of the family, they bring cameras to Cuba with the idea to sell it in Cuba, you know, to make money or in the United States because some of them, they have visas to go to the United States. And then that's the reason there is a lot of pictures. Most of the survivors in Great Britain, 
they have a picture and they donated to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. In Cuba, the museum is really small. And they have been trying to get this museum for the last five years. And the Cuban government, they were, nev they were never allowed to do it until the day they said that uh, they said to the government that they always going to explain in the museum that Cuba always helped the Jewish community in the country. No? And they, they opened this museum with a couple of pictures. They have a small picture of the St. Louis and uh, Steven Spielberg donated some videos about the Cuban, the Jewish, you know, the Jewish community that they were Holocaust survivors. Wow. Man, uh, this uh, obviously has become um, a passion of yours that um, uh, at what point after, you know, when you started collecting all of these, these artifacts mm -hmm. and these, um, uh, you know, these pieces of, of history, um, when did the, the novel actually start taking shape uh, in your mind? Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you, the, you've got the, the Nazi that, that then became a character and um, it, Kind of when did the the overarching uh, when did you realize that you had a big story here and this would be a novel? Yeah, it took a lot of time. I remember writing. I started writing like a small chapters, and then the first that chapter that I wrote it was in two thousand four, I think, and it was this old lady walking the street of Havana, going to you know to the harbor to Malecon, trying to clean her past and trying to find herself uh, with a small blue box that she's going to open at the end of her life. I remember writing that chapter and then I wrote about this guy living in a small town in Connecticut. I changed it later to New York. A Tuesday morning coming, you know, to downtown New York and he never came back and he never came back and then the family's trying, trying to find his past and his past is related to the St. Louis. Everything was like a playing chess for many years. And when I started meeting with my editor, every time that I presented her, you know, the last idea that I have, like the structure, she said, yes, we have a novel, let's do it. And I said, I'm not ready yet because I am, <laughs> I am a little obsessed with the structure. Even I have all this material and all this character I remember uh, I even bought a small uh, bottle of perfume from the 1930s and trying to see all these dresses and I acquired a couple of menus from the boat from the 19, uh, not the same uh, travesty, you know, the, but a couple of months before when the St. Louis went to New York. And then I have access to all the menus in the Holocaust Museum I was preparing the structure. Then I, he, I thought that it was too historical. It sounds like a said. And then I changed everything and started writing his first person. And my daughter, Emma, now she's 12 years old, like Hannah. But when I started writing, I remember the first sentence. It was like she was a little girl, like a nine years old, becoming 20, you know, from nine to 10. And the next year it was 10 to 11. And then 11 to 12, I think Hannah started growing up like Emma. And, and I thought that doing in the first person and talking, you know, through the eye for a little girl, the emotional connection is going to be bigger. Uh, and I want to have that kind of emotional connection in this story. And even this story happening 77 years ago is something that, can happen right now. We're talking about a leader girl. We're talking about a family trying to find a place in the world. I want to sound, at the beginning, I remember that I didn't have uh, any, because if you read the book, I never mentioned Hitler. I never mentioned the Nazis. I never, you know, the, the ogres, because it's through the eye of this leader girl. And at, at the beginning, I didn't want to have even 1939 or New York 2015 because I wanted to sound like a fairy tale in a place, in a magic place through the iPhone. But my, my editor said, you are gonna get crazy to all, <laughs> all the readers, they're gonna get crazy. You need to put some, at least New York 2014 because nobody knows what's happening. And then it was, it was right. 
to identify at the beginning of Berlin, 1939, and then, you know, all this day during the travels in between Hamburg to Havana, that it took 15 days to arrive in Havana. It was May 13 when they left and they arrived May 27. But, you know, it was working, it was, it was a process. It was a process. And, for example, I never talked to the survivors. I, I have access to, like, they gave me the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. They gave me 30 names with their phone number, a uh, survivor from the St. Louis. But I wanted to finish my book and then talk to them. Because this is the story. This is not like an essay. This is the story. This is fiction based in a real thing that happened that has an impact in me, on, in me and, and like my grandmother too. And it's, it's, a, it's my story at the same time. And then when I finished the book, I presented the draft to my editor. Then I started calling them. Some of them, they don't want to talk about the, the tragedy. It's still strong for them. But then I talked to Herbert Carliner. He was 13 years old when he was in the boat. He was with his father, mother, two sisters, and a brother. And and right now he's 90 something living in Miami and they were sent back to France and then he survived, he has, and his brother survived because they were sent to an orphanage in a non-occupied zone in France. The father, mother and sister, they were sent to Auschwitz and they were killed. And uh, Herbert said that when the boat, you know, when they leave, they left Cuba in June 2nd, 1939, then trying to disembark in the United States. And President Roosevelt said no to them. And when they arrived to Miami, Herbert told his father, Dad, I don't want to live in Cuba. I want to live in Miami when he saw the skyline. And then after many years, you know, he moved to Connecticut when he was 20 years old, I think. And then he moved back to Miami. He created a bakery. He's a, a happy guy right now with his family, his uh, children and grandchildren, and he's rich. He has a beautiful apartment in Miami, and and he's really fun. He's really fun to talk to him. I, I talked to another survivor, uh, Judith Ka uh, Steele, and she was she was 14 months old on, on the boat. With her father, mother, and grandfather, they were sent to France and she survived because they went, they were sent to a, 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 a concentration camp in France, like a provisional one, before sending them to Auschwitz. And the father, uh, the day before the train was going to take them to, to Poland, he exchanged her uh, with, uh, with jewelry to a, a French farmer. And then he survived the war. And, and in 1949, an uncle, from, a Jewish uncle from Washington High, asked for her, and she moved to the United States. And then she lost her French family. And you know, and then when I presented the book, every every, every month, I got an email or I call from a survivor, and you know, I traveled to meet them, and I found one living in Canada, and that's a, that's a funny thing. Uh, I, I remember like a, two years ago, I posted a day like today, you know, the St. Louis left uh, German, uh, Hamburg and if, in Facebook. And then a, a friend posted a, com a, a comment in my post and she said, uh, Armando, I think my, my, my mother was on that boat. I, and I, I met her, uh, Sylvia, my friend, she's living in Mexico. I met her in Cuba during the 80s. And I said, Sylvia, what is their, your mother's last name? And she said, Carmen. I said, no, Sylvia, it was your mother, your grandparents, your uncle, and your aunt that were in the, in the boat. What is your mother living? And then she took like a two days. I was des you know, desperate because I want to know exactly where this woman was living. And she was living in Toronto. I took the first plane the next day and met her. And she's Ana Maria Carmen. And I call her the Mexican of the St. Louis because they were sent to Holland and they survived Buchenwald, the concentration camp, the three of them. And the uncle, because he was married, he, he was Jewish, but he was married to a German woman. Um, 
they they never send them to the concentration camp because uh, the Hitler's law it was if you're in a mixed relationship if you sterilize you can survive and then he sterilized and they moved to Mexico and they were in Mexico when you know after the war and then Ana Maria her mother and father they moved to Mexico and she grew up there and then she you know she speaks German Dutch all the language English French and Spanish and she's living in Toronto with uh, her son and the book is a it, it was a bestseller in Canada and we toured a lot together we did a lot a, a, you know a lot of presentation together she's a strong woman and I love her yeah Nick Breaker's book, Essence, book one, Septima, one of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, book one, Septima, is a must read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Robin the folks that I sent you. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20, just dropped today. It is amazing with stories by Jess West, Rhett Bruno, Eamon Ambrose, Bob Williams. Tales is my favorite monthly publication. Go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode number 20, out right now. Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, This project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Cleaves, the Jason Crane series. Um, Armando, what, well, first off, um, in, in the front of the book, you have, uh, you have some quotes, some endorsements, uh, from some of the survivors, uh, of, uh, of, of the boat and that, that, uh, that, you know, uh, had wonderful things to say about the book. I, I can only imagine as the author, um, and, and I appreciate that you didn't want to talk to them ahead of time, uh, you know, because this was a novel and, and you wanted to, to tell, the story that, you know, that was in your mind, uh, but how rewarding was it talking to them afterwards and, and for them to say, you know, you really captured the, the spirit of the story okay. and told our story well. Do you know why? Because uh, it's, a, it's a piece of fiction and I create all this character, but the second chapter, uh, if you remember the first chapter is, Hannah in 1939 and Anna in 2015. It's back and forth. And then I dedicate the complete second chapter to the travesty, you know, to the 15th day between Hamburg to Havana. And the interruption between, between every chapter in the second part is the real cables and headlines from the newspaper. That's real. And then I try to reproduce everything that happened in the boat with every, every, you know, diary that I read, the document, the menu, the weather, everything. If you read that it was raining, May 13th, it was raining. If they ate a caviar and this kind of cheese, you know, May 27, it's because I have the menu. Everything is real. The music, the, the smell, the... The weather, everything is real in that chapter. I, that's, that was one of the, the things that I want to be exactly that what exactly happened, you know. Even uh, I mentioned the, the, the day when one of the passengers died, the, the guy who tried to kill himself, everything is real. I, I, don't, I didn't want to play with the story in that part. And I think... That's the reason they feel very connected, and 
And at the end, you know, Eva or Judith or Ana Maria, they are the real German girls. Um, Armando, a, a lot of people don't know the story of what happened uh, to the St. Louis. So in 1939, it left Europe uh, with the promise of taking uh, German Jewish refugees to Cuba. Uh, mm -hmm. what, hap what happened when the boat got yeah. there? Now, to have an idea, leaving in 1939 in May, uh, that was after Crystal Nash. And Crystal Nash was in 1938, November 8 and 9. And all the Jewish community, they lost everything. They even, they cannot use the newspaper or the phone or, or the children go to school. They closed the door for them. But these families, most of these German family that they took the St. Louis, they were rich. They were very rich and they feel more German than Jewish because they, they are like a five generations, some of them. They, they, that. And then at the same time, and that uh, they were uh, white, blue eyes, and most of them blonde, you know, they feel that they can survive all these racial, hysterical, you know, laws from Hitler. And they wait until last minute to get visas. In, in the spring of 1939, all the visas for Palestina, because Israel was called Palestina and, be, and you know, belonged to Great Britain at that moment, the 20,000 visas uh, it was at the beginning of the year, it was all of them taken. And then the only country who has visas available, it was Cuba. And they charged $150 per visa. And that was an opportunity. They applied for visas in the United States and Canada, uh, most of them. And they got it, but they have to wait uh, on between one to five years to to get in the country. And then Cuba it was like a, a, a space, like a, you know, a place to, to wait for the acceptance in, in the United States. Most of them, they, buy, uh, they bought houses in Havana because they received a letter from Manuel Benitez, the director of immigration of Cuba, saying that they were allowed to disembark in Cuba, but not work. They have to have money to survive all this year waiting for the visas for going to the United States. But when the boat left in May 13, 1939, a couple of days before the boat left, the president of Cuba, Laredo Bru, signed a decree with a, a number uh, 937, the same number of passengers that they have at the boat, saying that they were not allowed to disembark. And when the boat was in the middle of the ocean, the HAPAC, the, the, you know, the, the company who owns the St. Louis, they started sending cables to the captain saying that there is a problem. They have to go fast and arrive fast in Cuba because of the decree. And it was, you know, it was, this information was controlled. Nobody knew. They create like a, a small committee with, a, with men trying to, how to deal with all these passengers because uh, before the St. Louis, I think it was a small boat arriving in Havana, and they were returned to Germany with 40 passengers. And then they were scared. They trying to communicate with Lauren Berenson. He was the guy in New York helping Jew the Jewish refugees in Europe. And he traveled to Havana to meet the Cuban government to start the negotiation. And uh, the president Laredo Bru required when the boat arrived in Havana, $500 per passenger to let them disembark. disembark. And right now, $500 is nothing, but at that moment, it was a fortune. And think about that all the passengers that were only allowed to bring 10 Reichmark in the boat. And the committee, the, this organization helping refugees from Europe, they only have $2 million to help more than 6 million Jewish refugees. They cannot spend the whole money in 937 passengers. Uh, it was a week doing all this negotiation. And the powerful man from Cuba at that moment, he was the chief of army, uh, Batista, that he became president later. He, he, he through, the, through the spokesperson, I think he was a doctor, saying to all these negotiators from New York that he was sick. He has called and he cannot answer even the phone. And then 
Batista wake up from, he was out of his house June 2nd, the same day that the boat left. And, you know, in history, he's not guilty of this, that what happened with the St. Louis. He was, he came, you know, he washed his hand like Poncio Pilatos, my grandmother said all the time. <laughs> right. And, and then uh, they're trying to disembark in Miami and President Roosevelt said no. They're trying to go to Canada and Prime Minister Mackenzie said no. And in the middle of the ocean, uh, the, the committee helping the refugee trying to get permit to disembark in Belgium in number. And some of the passengers went to Great Britain, around 300, I think. The rest went to Belgium, France, and Holland. And as you know, the only that they can survive the war, it was the Great Britain one. Because in September, the war started and, you know, the Nazis was in, were in, in Belgium, in Holland, and in France. And most of them, they, they went to Auschwitz. And I think they survived. The, the people in, you know, in Great Britain survived and in, in, from the concentration camp, around 200 people survived too, most of them the children, because they went at the beginning to the orphanage, and, as I explained before. And it was really tough for them. Most of them, they lost their family and the connection. And, you know, that's the story of the St. Louis. Um, Armando, as uh, as we look back on history uh, from from our modern vantage point, and especially on on this uh, this horrible uh time in history we like to look back and see um the the way that world war ii finally ended and with the the allies all uh, rallying and and uh and pushing back the uh you know the the nazi forces and and uh, uh eventually liberating um you, you know those people and we don't like to think about the mistakes that were made early on, and we don't like to think that uh, that America uh, did not do the right thing in this case and and rejected these um, uh, these refugees. Uh, it, it's a horrible thing to mm -hmm. uh, to think about, and and we don't hear that part of the story. Um, and you know, and and we can all be you know Monday morning quarterbacks or, or whatever, and and think that you know because we have the benefit of hindsight. We would have made decisions differently. We, we don't know that. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of this book, especially in the telling, uh, there are a lot of modern uh, kind of equivalents to that. And uh, what do you see as someone who's gone back and has spent so much time in this period and with these people um, and the situation? What do you see uh, that? that we could learn from the situation about the world that we live in now? You know, I think uh, Ana Maria Carmen, one of the survivors, said in, in one of the trailers from the book that uh, that history repeats itself. It's, it's part of the, and as I explained before, we're always afraid of the other's one. This is part of the DNA of the human being. And we're trying to clean our hands and be separated from the tragedies of the other. We always, what is the reason, you know, all this country, because everybody knew what happening in the, in, in Germany with the Jewish community. I, I, I read the New, the New York Times from the 1939, 1940s, and they knew what happened in the, the, Warsaw Ghetto and in Poland and all this country, everybody knew that. Maybe you didn't realize that they were killing, I think they were killing 25,000 people per day in Auschwitz. That's maybe, it's a big number, but they knew, they knew, but you know, it's, it's their problem. Nobody wants the Jewish at that moment in the United States. One of the problems, because I read all the the communication between the State Department, the embassy, and the Cuban government, and the United States was worried about all these refugees coming to Latin America, you know, Peru, Venezuela, Argentina, Cuba, because at the end, they knew they want to go to the United States. It was going to be a problem after, you know, the crash in 1928, and they was trying to survive all this crisis in, in the United States. 
and it's it's really hard to to make it. I know you can you can accept all these refugees around the world, but you have to be look at what happened in Syria right now. What is the solution to accept millions of refugees in this country or trying to find a solution in the country because everybody's living right now? It's, it's, it's really complicated. And the story of the San Luis, what is the reason nobody talk about it? It's, 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 it's a shame. It, it took until 2009 that the United States Senate passed a resolution acknowledging the suffering of those refugees as a result of the refusal of the government of Cuba, the United States, and Canada. It was during the the Obama administration. In 2012, that was yesterday almost, the U.S. Department apologized publicly for what had happened to the St. Louis and invited the survivors to the headquarters. And in 2011, they own building in Halifax, Canada, a monument financed by the uh, Canadian government to recognize the, you know, the, the tragedy. Until now in Cuba, nobody talk about the tragedy of the St. Louis. It's only this small Holocaust museum with a picture and the donation that I did, but nobody wants to talk about uh, the, this tragedy because we all are responsible at them. Well, and, and I think that's why books like this are so important um, is because we, we look back on situations like this and, and we see it as a as as a huge monumental problem to solve. And and we see that when we see this as a as as millions of people or in this case, you know, uh, hundreds of people, um, it it seems like it, it's it's too big to uh, to solve and, and too big to get involved with. Um, mm-hmm. But but what what we do when we tell stories about this is we we humanize the people involved in this and we get to look into the eyes of individual people and and maybe that softens our hearts a little bit to do what we can uh, in the world uh, for our fellow humans and and You're not. Right. You know, it's it, it's it, it, some problems are so big that we can't tackle, but we can uh, we can help the people that we can help, and yeah. and I think that's important to to understand. That's exactly, and it's easy to say, you know, Hitler killed six million uh, Jewish, or we're talking about nine hundred thirty-seven passengers, but at the end they have a face, and and I'm happy that my editor agreed to put all these pictures at the end of the book and all this signature from the manifesto of the boat, because they are real, they have a face. You know, we're talking about Hannah, and Hannah, it could be your daughter. I remember writing a book and trying to get inside of the story, and I, because I have three children, I feel terrible if I have to make that kind of decision with my children when I, you know, even, Think about it. You cannot live here and you have to find a place and then you arrive in a place that they don't want you. What are you going to do with your your family? I was always thinking about that. Yeah. And and what an amazing job that you did. Um, the, the book is called The German Girl, and it is one of the most unique stories uh, that I've read in quite a while. Ar- Armando, you did Thank a you. fantastic job of opening my eyes to a situation that I, I honestly knew nothing about, uh, and and this story – uh, will will stick with you for uh, forever. Um, so uh, thank you for writing this book. No, thank you, Han, for having me in your podcast. Yeah. But at the end, you know, we're talking about tragedy. We're talking about the St. Louis. But at the end, the German girl is a love story. It's, it is. It's a love story between this Hannah and Leo trying and, you know, living in a turbulent time. And they promise love until the end of of their life, and, and then I wanted to read like uh, they are people. They are, you know, they are a family. They are trying to to understand the past and the thing that happened, and thing that you can control, and that happened to all of us all the time. Yeah. Well, and 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 I, I was going to say that next is that uh, is, is in the even in the midst of great tragedy like this, um, the human spirit just can't be held down, mm-hmm. uh, and and the love for one another, uh, 
you know, shines through. And you, you did a beautiful job, not only of, of highlighting the tragedies and, and opening my eyes to that, but showing me that even in the midst of that, um, you know, there, there still is hope. And uh, I think that's the ultimate story of the book. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Armando, if, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they, uh, where can they follow you and uh, where can they pick up a copy of The German Girl? Well, The German Girl, you can find in every bookstore right now. We are happy because we have it in Target, uh, you know, the paperback edition in English and Spanish, in Amazon, in all the independent bookstore, in Barnes & Noble. You know, it's in every place. And I have it, and I am very happy. And the book is translate is going to be translated to fourteen languages. It's, it's already well, in English, Spanish, in in Danish, in Danish, Norwegian, Sweden, Swedish, and it's going to be in Greek. It's going to be in Greece, Tur- Turkey, France, Portugal, Brazil. We're very happy. We're very well, happy. What an awesome story. Um, I would love to see this on the big screen. This would make an amazing <laughs> We're movie. Working so I, on it. We're working on it. Yeah. Oh, I love hearing that. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, Armando, uh, your your website is armandolucascorea.com, uh, exactly. and uh, they can get in touch with you there. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Han. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Natalie? It's Artie. Listen, I'm going to be late for dinner. I ran out of gas on... He climbed out of the car and peered at the sign. On Sleepy Hollow Road... There's nothing but trees, and I have to find a gas station. Save me a drumstick. He hung up his cell and stuck it in his pocket, zipping his jacket. He was going to have to walk and pray somebody picked him up. A sliver of crescent moon hung above, surrounded by clouds, like a grinning drunk asleep in a puddle. Artie walked, using his tablet as a flashlight, eyes on the gravel ahead. He crossed over a dark ravine, The trunks and overhanging branches were matted thick with wild grapevines and threw a cavernous gloom over the road. A figure stood at a crossroads ahead. It looked pale and wan and blue. A woman? He had an impression of fragility and age and thought of his warty old landlady. But his landlady would not be standing at a crossroads in the dark. Excuse me? Artie said, surprised by the fear in his own voice. Do you know where I can find a gas station? I'm... I'm empty. Then let me fill you, the figure whispered. It rushed at him. It entered him. He dropped the tablet, fell to his knees, and lost his body to another driver. When Artie woke again, he was dangling in midair. The woods were pitch black. The only lights were fireflies. Fireflies everywhere, like dancing stars. He struggled and cried out, his yellow sneakers trying to find the ground. Shh, said a voice. It will all be over soon. Panic rose. He felt invisible hands on his legs, on his arms, invisible fingers around his neck, reaching up the back of his shirt. He heard the sound of water running below, high and agitated, as if through a stony brook. The crescent moon swung out of the sky, falling into the water. Blood rushed into his cheeks. He realized he had been flipped upside down. He yelled and groped, flecking his own face with spit, helpless to drive away whatever was attacking him. He felt a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and air flew out of his lungs. A spray of blood hit his cheeks, hot and clinging. His hands found a sharp branch protruding from his body. It had speared him through his back and out through his chest. He tried to say help, but had no air to form the word. Blood poured up his body. No, it poured down. It only felt as if it were rising, climbing his neck, covering his face, gathering in his scalp. He reached for the ribbon of blood that fell from his crown into the trickle of moonlight below. 
The ribbon slipped through his fingers. It thinned, choked, became a tiny rivulet. His tanks were empty. Not even fumes. His engine began to sputter. The flow became a drip. A maddening drip, like the drip, drip, drip of his kitchen faucet. The drip his landlady hadn't fixed. The drip that kept him up at night. This drip would not be keeping him up. He would sleep very well this night. Very well indeed. The fireflies slipped into shadow. A figure appeared, blue as gaslight, bony and toothless. A crone from a fairy tale. Thank you, my friends, she whispered. I am thankful for this good harvest. She neared, scrutinized him with manic intensity, and turned away, muttering to herself in a sing-song rhythm as she, too, vanished into the trees. A man may toil from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. <laughs>